Great. Well, uh, thank you, Tony. That's a, a terrific framing. You know, I think as we're sitting here uh, thinking about these different domains of justice, filling out that form, the next several panels, I think, will also give you further food for thought. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the, the next panel, which will be led by Lisa Marsh Ryerson. Lisa is the, the president of AARP Foundation, um, where she has been leading them for the last six years? Six years already. Six years already, and <laughs> I won't go through her bio. It's an impressive set of accomplishments she's had leading the AARP Foundation. Uh, before that, she had uh, uh, nearly two decades as the president of Wells College, and so she's had a tremendous experience in higher education. So and I'll leave it to you, Lisa, to, uh, to introduce the panelists, but thank you so much for, for being here with us and for your support of the Joint Center. Thanks, Chris. It's always great to be with everyone. What a terrific day we're having already, and uh, you can read the bios of our panelists, Jennifer, Jim Malinsky, and Lauren Taylor in the program, but I also join in thanking Mildred and and Chris and Dave for collecting us together across disciplines and sectors to have this truly important conversation um, about the intersection of housing and aging and justice and health as well. I loved your presentations, Nancy and Tony. I think mm. Tony had to run off and catch the play. But Nancy, although you didn't grant us a degree, I think you badged us in <laughs> ethics a bit in your talk. But it was important for us to hear your view of how we should consider living together and the actions we would take to live together, how important it is to make decisions that are data-informed and evidence-based, but also with a practical orientation, thinking not just about ourselves, but about our neighbors as well. Uh, we must keep striving for justice in all that we do is the way you wrapped up, so thank you for that. I thought Tony's presentation was equally fascinating and important to ground us today, reminding us about something that I think we talk about every day, that words matter and definitions matter too. So thinking about how we build equity and move from checking a box to thinking about building communities where equity is an outcome that we reach through investments, through a practice, a process, a passion, and a commitment as well. So what, what a great, great beginning. Before I uh, turn the program over to Jen and Lauren and our dialogue, I want to give a shout out to two of my colleagues, incredible AARP leaders who are with us in the room today. Antron Watson from AARP Massachusetts. <laughs> it's really um, always great to be with you and a close colleague and friend of Vice President at AARP, Dr. Rodney Harrell. Rodney, who'll be speaking a bit later today. Five years ago, as you heard, I think a little bit earlier, just five years ago, Jen, AARP Foundation was really pleased to support what turned out to be groundbreaking research carried out by the Joint Center for Housing, the report on housing America's older adults. And last year, that study was updated, and now we have the release, just this week, of an important new supplement that gives an exceptionally clear-eyed view of the reality, the state of housing for older adults as it exists today, and what the trends are and where we're headed. And Jen will go into many more details about that study in just a minute. One thing that stood out for me, and I know will for you as well, is that inequalities, and Chris addressed this, and inequities are growing as the population ages. People who are 65 and older, those who were already doing well, reaped more of the benefits of the recovering economy than those who were not doing well when the downturn hit. Not a surprise, but bears repeating that middle and lower income households are facing growing and greater financial pressures. Their debt is rising and the number of households that are cost burden has reached an all time high. And at the same time, the number of older households is growing and Jen will explain this further, but in less than 20 years, older households will make up more than a third of the US households. And older adults and older households will face the need for suitably designed housing. That need will increase more and a growing number of older adults will find that suitable housing is unaffordable. 
And this is unacceptable for us in communities and in our nation. If housing is in fact the linchpin of well-being, as the original report five years ago called out, we need to implement solutions to ensure that older adults have access to affordable and safe and healthy homes. And Lauren, you'll talk more about that. Multi and truly cross-sector engaged collaboration is essential to identify and to put into practice solutions because the issue of developing and maintaining housing that allows older adults to age in place and age and community is intrinsically linked to justice as we've already heard this afternoon. And we've also heard that this of course requires a long-term commitment from nonprofits and for-profits from the government at every level, local, state, and national. The challenges that so many older adults face as they age stem from long-standing inequities that are both individual and also structural, including age discrimination, racial and ethnic discrimination, income inequality, marginalization on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. So addressing our nation's housing challenges as our population rapidly ages is also, as we've discussed, a moral matter. As Rabbi Prince said at the 1963 March on Washington for jobs and for freedom, quote, neighbor is not a geographic concept, it is a moral concept. Housing then is not just a physical concept or a spatial concept, it's a societal concept, a moral concept, it's an emotional concept when we think of that word home. And a home, as we know, is not just a matter of having a structure. It's a matter of a nurturing and sustaining environment, one that exists within a livable community, as Rodney will emphasize, where attention is paid to all aspects of our well-being for all members of families, families across the lifespan, who seek to age in a place, and also who seek to age in a community, and who seek to age together. What's more, a home must be socially connected and be filled at, with people who are engaged in all aspects, allowed to continue to contribute to all aspects of community life. As society works to fulfill the desire of the vast majority of older adults to age in place or age in community, we have to be mindful of the reality that a home can still become unhealthy if it becomes a place of social isolation. So a home that might at one point be a refuge may become somewhat of a prison later on in life. So as I turn to our distinguished panelists, I'd ask all of us to keep in mind as they're talking a couple of ideas or a couple of things. How will we use what we learn today and also what we know through the important studies that will be discussed? How do we come together as leaders to make a difference now sooner rather than later? What steps must we take now so that both individuals and communities thrive? I'm happy, as I said, to be joined by Jennifer Jen Malinsky, a senior research associate at the Joint Center for Housing Studies. And, and Jen manages the center's work on housing for older adults. And also Lauren Taylor, who is a doctoral candidate in health policy at the Harvard Business School. Jen, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, I think I'm mic'd up over here. Um, thank you, Lisa, and uh, thank you for your continued support of our work. As Chris said, it's been um, a great relationship to have with you and the foundation. Aha, okay. Um, so we're pleased to be here today um, with our colleagues. That, that, as Nancy said, this has been a long time in the making. It also um, coincides with the release of our new report this week. Um, and so I'm going to take you through some of the findings from that report, which did this year focus on inequality, but also because we are a diverse group, I'm just going to start with a few of the ways that housing is important for older adults, just those specific ways. Um, I think, as Nancy said um, up front and, and um, our other uh, previous speakers, um, this isn't only we want livability not just for older adults. Certainly housing has special importance for children and families, and there are special things that those um, populations need. But in the focus on older adults, I just want to draw those out um, today. Um, but 
but first, just to give a sense of, of where we are, um, one of the reasons any of our topics um, here today matters is that the U.S. is an aging society. We've certainly seen an upswing in the number of people in their 60s and 70s as that leading edge of the baby boomers has reached those ages. The, the first baby boomers are now 73. Um, and in the next decade, households in their 80s will be the fastest growing age group in the nation. And you can see that on the very far right, how big of it, um, an increase we're going to be seeing between 2018 and all the way to 2038. So as uh, Lisa just said, by 2038, a third of all households will be 65 or over, and 12% will be 80 or over, which is rather unprecedented in the history of our country. And when we think about the changing needs of households at that age, um, it's a really important figure to keep in mind. So we start from this premise that housing is a platform for well-being, or a, a linchpin for well-being is, is even the better term. Um, and it's true for all ages. Housing is a shelter from the elements. It's critical to health for all people. And perhaps we see this most obviously in the emotional and physical effects on people who lack housing or who face housing insecurity. It's a base to go out, um, from which to go out into the world. It's the largest part of most people's budgets. For homeowners, the dwelling is the largest asset that they'll probably ever have and an opportunity to build wealth. A house, of course, can be a source of pride and self-esteem, the refuge. Um, and for all people, a house is a home, which is you know, at the base of all of, all of this that we talk about. There are some particular ways that housing is important to older adults. Um, in particular, the cost of housing is really central to financial security in retirement. Incomes decline in later years. Um, the median income from 65 to 79 is much higher than the median income uh, for those 80 and over. Um, and not being able to afford your housing can mean cutting back on other necessities that are critical to health and well-being. And I'll show you some trends on that a little bit uh, later. The physical features of the home are, of course, central to managing um, and maintaining independence in later years, whether one is safe, whether the home is accessible to those with physical limitations. Um, older adults also happen to spend the majority of their time in the home, so these features are really critical. Where housing is located is also very important um, to quality of life and well-being. Its proximity to services, to amenities, and other people um, is central to remaining engaged, avoiding loneliness, and, and doing all the things that people want to do um, in later life. Um, the connections between housing and care are increasingly important for this demographic, too. And Lauren will really speak to this in a few minutes. And finally, as is true, housing in a home is a very, you know, an emotional connection for a lot of people. But um, for older adults, it may represent a repository of memories. It may be the place that one raised their children, had their family. And it can often be staying in the same home can be a sort of a sense of stability amidst other changes in life. So there's some particular reasons that it might be um, significant for older people in that way. As Lisa previewed, <laughs> um, access to affordable and suitable housing, though, is unequally distributed. Um, Age-associated disadvantages, such as increased disabilities, overlap with these in unequal access to healthy places, suitable housing, and the other social determinants of health. Um, many people in, um, throughout their lives have been affected by these, and by the time they're older adults, the disadvantages are, are compounded. So there are vast differences in people's experiences of late life and also in their opportunities to live affordably and safely. Now, I'm going to highlight four areas of concern that we drew out in this report. Rising inequality in income and home ownership, rising debt levels, um, and... and and I will get back to those in a second. Um, so just um, a first point, housing tenure, by which we mean whether you own or rent, really matters. Um, most older adults are homeowners. 80% own their homes. Um, ownership peaks in the 70s and then declines somewhat as people leave homeownership and choose to rent. However, even among those 80 and over, the um, homeownership rate is still higher than the national average for older adults. So first point about housing tenure is that most older adults are homeowners, but we still have a significant share who rent. The second point about tenure is that owners have higher net worth, um, most likely because they needed some wealth to enter homeownership to begin with, but also importantly because homeownership provided an opportunity for them to build wealth. And you can see this in this chart here. Um, the median um, renter has a net worth of $6,700. And you can see that the lowest income, if, if you divide all incomes into, four, into fourths, 
Those with the lowest income, 65 and over, renters have $1,000 in the bank as compared to um, a homeowner who has um, $100,000 in the bank. When you look at the lower middle, that 65 and over, um, the median income is really similar. Owners and renters are both in that $33,000, $34,000 range. And again, the vast, vast differences in wealth and, and the assets. Um, as you go up the income, the income um, levels, you're more likely to have more of your wealth outside of your home equity. The, the lower income you are, the more of your wealth is tied up in the home. So you are kind of house rich, perhaps, but cash poor. Um, but this is a really um, significant difference between owners and renters that we need to think about. Another point, though, that this chart makes is that because, just because you're a homeowner does not mean that you are set. So low and moderate income homeowners um, don't necessarily have a lot of wealth outside of that home. Um, and if they want to stay in that home, that, that can be an issue. Um, a third point um, is that ownership is not evenly distributed. We know this. Home ownership rates by race and ethnicity are ve very different. Um, there are large gaps, in fact. And unfortunately, our new report shows that the gaps by race are widening among older adults. Um, so you can see on the left, I'm mean, sorry, on the right, age 65 and over, the um, white older adults are on the top. Um, and the gap with the black older adults, the light blue line, it narrowed their pre-housing crash, but it has gone farther apart. And now we're at actually a 30-year high in the gap between black and white older home ownership. Um, the gaps between Hispanic um, and white and Asian and white are, are similarly large, although not, not as large. Um, and the last point I want to make about housing tenure is that it's sort of looking at an intergenerational um, check. So we have these inequities among older um, people over the 65 and over, but we also have uh, some trends within those um, pre-retirement now that are worrying for the future. So the home ownership rate of those who are currently 50 to 64 is lower than it was for the previous generation at the same age. This group suffered more losses to home ownership during the foreclosure crisis. So a higher share of this group will enter retirement without the benefits of home ownership that you saw on that asset chart. Um, so something to, for us to think about you know, this is not just a story about today. Um, we have a lot of inequity today and a lot of need. Uh, what is it going to look like in 10, 15 years? Uh, the second point I want to make that we um, pull out in the report is that median income for households 65 and over um, is is about uh, 41,000. But if you look by these two ages, for the 65 to 79, it's it's in the 40 near 47,000 and it falls to 29,000 by the time people are 80. So for all groups, whether you're an owner or a renter, um, whether you are um, whatever race you are, incomes tend to decline um, on the median with older age. Um, so this is very relevant for housing, as most people pay for housing out of their income and not their savings. And affordability is a direct function of income and the cost of housing. So we say someone is unaffordably housed if they spend more than 30% of their income on housing. And if with declining income in either stable or rising housing prices, you can see the problem. Trends show that disparities among older households in income are growing. And among those 65 and over, the biggest gains have gone to the top earners. You can see that in both the 50 to 64, in fact, and the 65 and older. Um, so this is not, you know, this would be reflected at younger ages as well, but it is carrying into retirement. And trends for those 50 to 64 are similar, but there's an additional worry that that group, again, are in real terms not, um, they're not back to where they were in the year 2000. So their real income has not recovered fully from the recession. Um, and it, that suggests that they're approaching retirement age in a less advantageous position um, than their predecessors. This is the number of um, cost burden older adults. So those people, those households who are paying more than 30% of their um, income on housing. And we are um, at an all time high. We've reached almost 10 million of those older adults in this situation. That's more than ever before. Um, and that is in a, a, a economy that has been overall um, strong. You'll remember that we have many more owners than renters, so renters are much more likely to be cost burdened. But because we have so many owners, owners, there are actually more owners with cost burdens. 
And we broke this out by owners with mortgages and without because it turns out having a mortgage is a big difference in your um, propensity to be cost burdened. And as I'll show you in a second, more and more people are entering older age with mortgages. And the consequences, of course, of having um, a cost burden and an affordability challenge is that you're forced to make cuts elsewhere in many cases. So the biggest cuts that we see for older adults are in food, health care, um, in the uh, people who are still saving for retirement and in transportation. This is the difference among very low income people in their spending on food, health, retirement and transportation versus those people who are paying more than 50% of their income on housing. And you can see, obviously, that there are pretty dramatic cutoffs. These, um, these uh, expenses all happen to be rarely relevant to health and to well-being. So this is, you know, again, a way that housing links back to um, health and well-being. Finally, on this point, I just want to note that um, we do have housing assistance in this country. It is not an entitlement. Um, we only serve about a third of older adults who are eligible for rental assistance, um, public housing or vouchers or, or whatever that might be. Um, so right now, we, the gray on the, the left side are those that we assist, and then the yellow are those people who are unable to get assistance. Um, so they qualify, but they are on a waiting list or they're um, living elsewhere, they're trying to make do on the open market. Um, but that's now, when we project ahead with population growth, and if we hold that share that's low income constant, and there are maybe reasons to think that might actually go up, we're looking at a great amount of need going forward. And just keeping pace with serving a third is perhaps a political challenge that, um, that we need to discuss. The third major point I wanted to raise is about um, the shares of older adult with debt, um, and they, that is on the rise. rise. So um, mortgage debt among older households, 46% of those in their 65 to 79 year old years have housing debt mortgages, but 26% of those 80 and overdue as well. The 80 plus is up 17 percentage points in just this last decade. Um, and of course, uh, older black and Hispanic homeowners are more likely to carry mortgage debt. 59 percent of black owners, 65 and over, and 50 percent of Hispanic owners um, of that age, compared to 39 percent of whites and 36 percent of Asians. So um, there are inequities in that, and there are concerns about um, the amount that mortgage debt adds to your monthly costs. Um, if that weren't bad enough, we have student debt, and I, I'm sorry to all the students in the audience um, that you might be thinking <laughs> decades from now, um, but uh, the share of those 50 to 64 with mortgage debt has doubled in the last decade. Um, it's gone from 7 to 16 percent. So, you know, if at a very minimum, having student debt is likely to inhibit your saving for retirement. Credit card debt, other forms of consumer debt also on the rise. So, you know, carrying this debt into retirement um, does give us pause. And again, that 50 to 64 year old group with this debt gives us um, some pause about challenges to come ahead. Um, the need for accessible and house housing and supportive services um, increases with age. We know this by just the simple statistics and those of you from the health side of, of the um, audience will recognize this, of course, that disabilities related to mobility, self-care, or being independent, things like shopping and cooking um, and housekeep housekeeping, all that increased pretty dramatically in the 70s into the 80s. And this is true for all groups, although there are real disparities in where different groups start out on this. So this lumps all those disabilities from the previous slide together. But renters, minorities, lower income people are going to experience those um, things earlier in life than other people who are more well off. Um, to some extent, there's some meeting up in the older age groups. The income sort of con converges a bit and so that everyone is sort of on the equal playing field at 80 or over. But um, but that's after years of difference. Um, and in some cases, as in race, there, there never is a total convergence. Um, so those with mobility disabilities in particular, I'll talk about that first, often benefit from accessibility features like grab bars, doors and hallways wide enough for a wheelchair or a walker, single floor living, no step entries into the home. Um, this is sadly not the state of our current housing stock. Um, if you tabulate those things separately and then add them together, those three features up here, single floor living, 
no step entrance into the, whole, uh, the home, and extra wide hallways and doorways, less than three and a half percent of our housing stock has those three features. Um, and as I have talked to one of our later speakers, Rodney, about, we have reason to believe this might be an overestimate um, in terms of how we calculate these things. So thinking about um, how are we gonna make up this difference when people are in need of those features um, is, a, is a big, big challenge. Another point just to, to make, um, to, to sort of fill out the story is that older adults are um, increasingly living in low density locations. Um, the, you can see um, from 2000 to 2017 too, there's been quite a jump, uh, especially in the low density areas. So this, this isn't necessarily people moving to low density locations, it's people aging in those places and they've crossed that line into age 65 and now they're in that bar, um, that, bright, that bright blue bar. But you can see even among renters, the biggest growth has been in low density areas. So most renters do happen to be in higher density places, but the biggest growth in the last decade has been in low density areas. Those places present challenging challenges for services, service delivery, for transportation, that is not a private car. Um, and those homes in those places are mostly single family detached structures that are among the least accessible. Another fact to also round out the story is that with age, more people live alone. So um, you can see that it's maybe, I think it's 37% um, are married couples, 42% live alone from 65 to 79. But for the 80 and over group, it reaches 57% of households are single person households. Um, so that's another concern when we think about having help in the home, you're gonna to have to have it from outside, not from a spouse or, or someone else that you might live with. So as that leading edge of the baby boomers reaches 80 in the next decade, we're gonna see an increase in the single family homes. And finally, um, to put our aging society in the context of some other significant challenges, um, like climate change, um, it's important to point out that older adults are vulnerable to natural disasters in ways that other age groups aren't. Uh, rising temperatures can mean more asthma, allergies, respiratory issues. The greater likelihood of flooding events um, relate to challenges with evacuation, disruptions to care, and I think we've all seen the horrible stories of nursing homes being affected by the hurricanes. Um, that we've suffered in this country. Um, and then there's hazards that come after, such as mold and that, th that effect on, on health. Um, and as if all of this weren't enough to single serious challenges ahead, some new studies also point to an increase in homelessness among older adults, including older veterans. Now we've really made a big effort to address veteran homelessness, but the only group where it's actually growing is the older group. Um, so those currently in their mid-50s to their mid-60s, the second half of the baby boomers have as a cohort experienced more homelessness throughout their lives than previous generations. They came of age um, at a time when the economy was tougher, the um, job market and the housing market were filled with the early baby boomers. Um, and so for all these reasons, we anticipate seeing more older people who are unhoused um, going forward. And since older people who are in that situation experience geriatric health conditions much, much earlier, um, that is another challenge. Um, by the way, my job today was to show you the challenges, not to be particularly uplifting. <laughs> the uplift is coming later, <laughs> I promise. Um, <laughs> so, um, other speakers are gonna to talk today more about aging in place and some of the solutions. Um, Anne Forsyth, unfortunately, couldn't be with us today. She was scheduled to talk, um, and I'm gonna just go through a couple of her um, points that she wanted to make today, too. Um, she's been reviewing literature concerning aging in place, and as we think about all of these challenges and we think about people's you know, preferences for where they want to stay, um, we often say most people wanna age in place, but what does that really mean? And so she has, um, pulled apart a bunch of definitions from the literature, from um, public sites, from all these different ways we use this term, and she's identified at least eight overlapping definitions of aging in place. And I think that you can probably relate to this. So for some people, it means I'm never going into a nursing home. For some people, it means um, I'm never leaving this house. And there's a whole host of things in the middle, and there's different values um, 
under, well, underlying all of those different uses of the term. So for some people, it's about choice. It's about self-determination. It's about independence. For other people, it really can be about not moving, not leaving this particular home where you have the memories. So I think this is just, um, there's a lot of richness in here, and, I, it, and it is a complex situation. And it is also, as Anne also points out, a really changeable situation. Uh, aging in place is not a one and done, you make the decision. Um, it's something that evolves over time um, across your needs, the, the needs of the people who care for older people. Um, it is diverse, it, is, um, it evolves as the, the relationship between the person and the fit with the house and the neighborhood changes. Um, and there's a lot of people involved in decision making too, not easy to untangle. So just to keep these things in mind, I think as we go forward will be really important um, and we think about uh, policies around aging in place, this is, um, this is good to be thinking about. Um, so that is it for me. I'm gonna turn over to Lauren to talk about the connection between housing and healthcare. Um, our new report is available online if you didn't pick it up outside. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. I have slides, right? That and as Lauren Perfect. makes her way to the podium, remember you can keep the conversation going by using the hashtag aging in a place. All right, hi everybody. It's good to be at the Graduate School of Design. I've spoken at a number of different places on Harvard's campus. I started at the Divinity School, then I went over to the Public Policy School, the Med School, and now I sit at the Business School, but I've never had a chance to be here. And I walked into the term neoliberalism and I thought, well, I'm definitely not in the Business School anymore. <laughs> That's not a term we use there. Uh, okay, so my job is to talk about housing and healthcare. I've got basically three parts to this talk. I thought at one point, uh, let me review some literature. I heard that Nancy this morning was saying there's a need to be evidence-based, and so I thought I would review some of that literature in a very broad strokes kind of way, just talk about uh, different pathways that we know housing relates to health. Then I'll talk a little bit about what we think is happening in the policy world now, ways in which healthcare, health insurance organizations, health policy are sort of starting to glom on to what we call social determinants of health, housing being a prime one among them. And I can tell you just a little bit about what that's looking like. And then finally, I was gonna review uh, some of the potential issues that I see coming down the pike if we let healthcare kind of own all of housing or own all of the social determinants of health writ large. So I'm gonna try and do that in just about 15 minutes. Uh, perfect, so um, I only made slides to show you where I'm talking from. It's not because I think my work is better than others, but because I believe in transparency. So this is a brief that I wrote for Health Affairs last year, summarizing what we think we know about the relationship between housing and health. This was not a systematic review, but it was an overview, meaning I was trying to just pull out um, some of the kind of top line key findings. And I think one way to think about the relationship between housing and health is through the following kind of four pathways. The first one is there's a whole bunch of studies out there that really focus on housing stability and its impact on health. So Jen was just saying, we're seeing rising levels of homelessness among older Americans. And so there's a great deal of study, you'll be shocked to know, that says being homeless is really bad for your health. <laughs> Um, it turns out if you don't have some kind of more, uh, mental illness going that forces you onto the street or into a position of being homelessness, you are almost certain to exit homelessness as a state of being with some kind of psychological trauma. So homelessness, but not only homelessness, in this stability category, you've got a whole set of papers that talk about couch surfing, being behind on rent. These things are especially bad for mental health outcomes, but they also show some kind of physical health outcome diminishments as well. The second kind of pathway here is around safety and quality. And these pathways can bleed into one another. So again, this was my effort to give kind of the gestalt of the literature, but we could quibble about whether a paper should go in one place or the other. But safety and quality broadly kind of encompasses home modification programs in particular. So in-home changes that you make to someone's living environment that are then associated with health. So the two really famous ones here, uh, one at one end of the age spectrum usually are things like community asthma initiatives. When someone who is cycling in and out of often the emergency department, but maybe other kind of healthcare providers with frequent flare-ups of asthma, in many cases what they found is you can go into that person's home and make a series of fairly simple modifications, change out carpets, 
pest removal. Uh, you can put in air filters and really dramatically improve the number of times that that person needs to be disrupted coming into a hospital or a doctor's office and also bring down their health care costs uh, quite a bit. This has been done in randomized control trials all over the country and so is considered kind of a gold standard of home modification. It is good for health, it brings down health care costs, and it's fairly low touch, meaning you can go in, you can do it once, or you can do it once in a while, but it's not something like home care that requires like hours in the day all the time. The second kind of safety and quality intervention, which I think we might talk about more later, is something like capable. So I imagine this may be familiar to this group, but this is also a home modification program pioneered out of Baltimore Hopkins, where a combination of a handyman, an occupational therapist, and a nurse will go into an older American's home over 10 weeks, sorry, 10 visits over four months. Uh, and they too have shown that the individual can really improve in their activities of daily living and that it can be, I think, frankly, shockingly cost saving. So they estimate it's $867 per month per person decrease in Medicaid expenditure, which comes out to about 10K a year, and the cost of the intervention is $3,300. So it's a huge savings. Those are the kinds of things that are in that safety and quality pathway. Let's go to affordability. This one is like almost so self-evident that I feel silly talking about it, but affordability means when you're spending upwards of 50% of your money on rent, <laughs> that you don't have money to do other things, like pay for the basic healthcare that you might need, pharmaceutical drugs, things like this. And so there's a lot of studies about how people allocate money. And what we find is again and again, people find housing to be really important. And so they'll put dollars there almost first, and then other things get short shrift. And those other things can often be health investments. And so we find that people who have really high rent burdens or just housing burdens generally, suffer worse health than people who feel that their housing is affordable. The fourth pathway are kind of these neighborhood studies. So you think about a neighborhood study in a bunch of different ways, and the bucket is quite expansive. So there's a whole bunch of work on things that are uh, the physical or the built environment. There's work out of Penn that shows even living in a community that has green space can lower your blood pressure, meaning if you walk by or you drive by a park, you have lower blood pressure than a similarly characteristic control group that does not have that on their daily commute or does not have that in their community. Things like, are there sidewalks, you know, places to walk, get exercise, violence, so what are the crime statistics of your home uh, environment or your community? And then really importantly, I think an emerging area here is the relationship between segregation and people's health. Communities that are highly segregated, holding aside all of the other characteristics, like the proportion of people who are different races, all of the sidewalk features, built environment, Segregated neighborhoods suffer worse health than those neighborhoods or communities that are less segregated. Maybe the other neighborhood study to just touch on briefly because I think it reveals some of the incredible complexity of thinking about the neighborhood pathway in particular is the Moving to Opportunity study. So I don't know, just put your hand up if you know Moving to Opportunity. Okay, some but not a ton. Um, Moving to Opportunity was a 10 or 15 year study funded by the Department of Housing and Urban Development that basically set out with a research question that said, if we move a family from a high poverty neighborhood to a low poverty neighborhood, what are the impacts on that family? Meaning, what are the impacts on mom and dad's health? What are the impacts on mom and dad's lifetime earnings? What are the impacts on kids' health? And to the extent that we continue to track these uh, enrollees, what are the long-term impacts on kids' earnings? And what they found, this was a randomized control trial, so gold standard of research, very difficult to do. It takes something like HUD to really get behind a project like this. It's not something that a university usually can do on its own. But they randomly assigned vouchers. They moved several hundred families. Maybe it was even more. And what they found is this really interesting mixed bag. So at least at the 10-year mark, they found that jobs and earnings among parents were not substantially changed, which had been this big hypothesis that if you move people from a high poverty neighborhood to a low poverty neighborhood, they'll get different jobs, they'll have more money, et cetera. That did not seem to be the case. They did find substantial health improvements, BMI, hypertension among parents. And then they also found it among girls, so children, female, but not among children, male. 
And the reason they thought that it was not among children male is because of the displacement factor. And so I think this was not anticipated in the study, but the disruption of moving away from your home is the leading rationale both for why boy, young boys' uh, health did not improve the way girls did and why the kind of jobs and the earnings did not change the way it was expected to. So now to make sense of moving to opportunity, I'm not an expert in it, but I think it just raises some of this complexity that when you think, oh, you can change these modifications from ex external forces and this will surely get us better health outcomes or it'll surely get us better social outcomes, there's often a shadow side. Uh, and in this case, it was kind of the social disruption, picking people out of their social networks and putting them in a new place and just how uncomfortable that can be that you don't count on, but I think is part of what we're here to talk about today. Just a few reflections on the literature. Uh, the most evidence, I would say, is clearly in the stability and the quality and safety pathways. That may be because they're the easier ones to study in some sense. And the strongest evidence is in mental health outcomes, psychological distress, um, and things like that. Second most is around physical health outcomes. And then I would say the least evidence is around the cost savings. And I can say a bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, I would say there's also very little work flashing back to that neighborhood pathway. We've got a lot happening in cities, almost nothing available to researchers who are interested in knowing how community environments influence health in a suburban environment and certainly a rural environment. There's just a total dearth. And then the other challenge, I think, uh, fr from a healthcare perspective, and certainly if I were talking to a room full of doctors, I would have to call out immediately, we don't understand the mechanism very well in a lot of these cases, meaning we don't necessarily always know why it is when you move someone from one neighborhood to another, their health gets better or their health gets worse. Plenty of hypotheses one could throw out. I already suggested one. You could say, oh, it's something about social disruption or picking people out of their network. But then you're still left with this question, but how does it get under the skin? Like, how does it actually change your blood pressure? How does it actually change your blood sugar? And there, you know, a lot of people will say, maybe it all runs through stress, some kind of systolic load, um, but, uh, sorry, cortisol load, but it's not clear. And there have been efforts to try and track stress in all sorts of biomedical ways, and it's not been totally clear that that's what's happening. And so in some sense, I'm going to tell you next that healthcare is getting very interested in housing and is starting to invest more. But I would say the lack of a really clear mechanism between many of these housing interventions and health outcomes is part of why health care has traditionally been a little more reticent and they're not quite sure they want to get in the game. OK, so next I just want to say two things maybe about policy. I would say both at the Medicaid and the Medicare levels, um, that is federal policy, state policies, and then at the Medicaid and Medicare managed care levels, which are the individual private organizations, you're seeing new appetite for investment and provision of services outside of the traditional medical scope of services. So an, in, uh, an example of this would be, you've got Care More Health, which is a Medicare managed care organization out in California. They have started a really robust social isolation program targeted at older Americans who um, self-report as being lonely. And so this health insurance company now has totally redesigned its waiting rooms to try and make them social spaces where people can come and just spend time rather than waiting for appointments. They've also created specific gyms that they're calling Nifty After 50. They're very proud. They've had their first marriage out of their Nifty After 50 gyms. <laughs> And they have social workers who will periodically just call people and say, hey, Mrs. Jennings, what's going on? What have you been doing this week? OK, I'll call you again next Tuesday. I look forward to hearing how it was seeing grandkids or what have you. It's a very light touch intervention that they claim has dramatically reduced the amount that they have to pay for these enrollees in terms of health care expenditure. So just a taste of the ways in which Medicare managed care companies are changing their scope. Here in Massachusetts, we're undergoing a Medicaid redesign, and housing has been front and center uh, in many ways. So the state has decided they are going to create Medicaid managed care, uh, sorry, Medicaid accountable care organizations. We've got, I think, nine of them here in Boston. They're basically the big hospitals that have become accountable care organizations. And social determinants of health generally, housing, domestic violence, isolation, uh, have been front and center in this reform. 
And so one of the things the state has done is opened up pots of money called flexible service dollars, where Medicaid accountable care organizations can apply to the state Medicaid office and say, we'd really like to provide housing search or housing navigation, some kind of housing support to Medicaid enrollees. Now, um, it's a baby step, right? Because the real problem in Boston in particular is not that we don't have enough housing navigation or enough housing search, but that we don't have enough affordable homes. So in many cases, we've got people case managing and navigating Medicaid and... Did my mic go out? Oh, hello. Am I back? I'm back, okay. Uh, I want, I want to make sure everyone heard this. It's an 8,000 person waiting list, I believe, in the city of Boston that we are now house navigating people to uh, as part of a Medicaid benefit. And then maybe the other thing that's happening, just thinking about people who are potentially homebound, is in the state Medicaid redesign, the real darling of the flexible services program is something called um, medically tailored meals. So there's one community-based organization who has done a randomized control trial on home delivered meals and they have found, again, an extraordinary amount of savings. Uh, these medically tailored meals are, think of uh, Meals on Wheels, but they are pre-screened to be friendly for a diabetic or friendly for someone who has other kind of dietary restrictions. And so um, all of these Medicaid accountable care organizations are applying to the state for these flexible service dollars to then contract with this community-based organization to get their enrollees these home-delivered meals. So now I just want to flip to, I've told you, uh, look, there's an evidence base for thinking about housing and health together. And I've told you, uh, look, there's policies that are changing to try and enable healthcare delivery organizations and health insurance companies to do more around maybe not only housing, but social isolation, home delivered meals. And now I just want to issue kind of a cautionary note. So this is a piece that I wrote for Hastings Center Report. Also last year, uh, I believe that there's kind of a, uh, a flyer out on the table for this special issue, which was fabulous. But the reasons for caution are just as follows. Um, if we think about how we want to fund all sorts of social services, including housing, I think there's a real temptation to say, well, let's just let the healthcare organizations do it. Uh, because they seem to be enthusiastic about it. They have a lot of managerial competence. They're very responsive to financial incentives. So if we started to say, look, you're not only going to get penalized for readmissions, but you're going to get penalized for every enrollee you have that is homeless. Maybe they would really hurry up and do something on this front. So I think it's like pragmatically tempting to just say, as much of this work that you want to do, healthcare, you should do it. But I want to lay out maybe just three cautions here. Um, the first is there's a real concern about letting healthcare value social interventions, including housing. Because what happens is they'll value it, and they'll value it rigorously, meaning they'll do all sorts of randomized control trials and give you a very precise estimate of what they think it's worth to have someone housed. But the issue is it's only capturing part of the pie, because when someone from Hopkins School of Public Health evaluates capable, in this case it's a great outcome, they say $867 of savings per month per person. That's only savings to Medicaid. Imagine the savings to ambulance companies. Imagine the savings to uh, next of kin who no longer have to take time off to come over. It's only capturing one part of the pie. And so I think we can get into a, a sort of lazy stance where we just say, oh, well, whatever medical journals say the value of an intervention is, is what it is. But in fact, I think we should always be skeptical. It is a downward estimate in all cases. And so we should always just be thinking about what else are they not counting in terms of the cost savings in particular associated with these interventions. There's also just concern about how complicated it would be to allow healthcare to really get deeply into the housing game. So imagine we keep going down this path and the states say, yes, you can do more investment in housing. We'll even set money aside for you to build new housing. But then we're in a world in which the states are giving healthcare organizations money. There's transaction costs there. Healthcare organizations are probably then contracting with some kind of community-based organization that actually has expertise in housing, and then we're hoping that that money actually gets spent the right way. It's just an additional kind of routing that I don't see as terribly necessary. I think there's also concern that healthcare organizations are inherently kind of places where money gets trapped and vaporized. So the thought that you're gonna be the state, you're gonna give money to a healthcare organization to do more in housing, um, you're not sure that that money ever is going to make it out of that healthcare organization's coffers. 
And then finally, the point I would raise is just an equity one, which is I get very concerned, although we don't have true entitlements in housing, at least there are things in Massachusetts where if you're under a certain threshold of income, you are eligible to enroll in X, Y, or Z. But if we let healthcare do a whole lot of this, as I think they are moving into the stance of wanting to do, you'll be in a world in which, well, it's a particular benefit to get something from X healthcare organization's insurance company, but not Y's. But it will no longer be the case that everyone under 125% of the federal poverty line is eligible. Because now, essentially, these private organizations, they're nonprofits, but they operate a whole lot like private for-profit businesses will be setting their own standards and it will kind of be contingent on which health insurance company you enroll in will define what kind of social benefits you get. Home delivered meals, housing, uh, all sorts of income supports potentially. This is not happening now, but I'm issuing the caution so that we don't continue to kind of slug trail down the path of letting healthcare gobble up social determinants of health. Finally, I would just say some people say, um, oh, just let healthcare do whatever it wants. If they're enthusiastic about this space, that's great, invite them in. And I think that's right. We want to invite them in and be engaged, but I don't think we want them to have it entirely. The critique of my position would be, oh, Lauren, you're just not being realistic. Like this is, we're living in a second best world, and so therefore you should be more, you should get more comfortable with the fact that healthcare is going to be a big player here. But anytime I hear someone say, oh, Lauren, we're living in a second best world, you know, theory of the second best, get with it. I just have to ask, like, well, is that really the best we can do? Or when you tell me we're living in a second best world, is that just a failure of political imagination? And I think that's one of the things I'd love to talk to you about. My time's up. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lauren. How are you all doing out there? You've just uh, heard a lot, but as, but as Jen uh, reminded us in her remarks, this is the section of the program where we're saying ideal versus reality. And so this was the dose of evidence uh, framing the reality of what's happening uh, in the housing and housing and healthcare landscape for older adults. We have a lot to talk about, hmm. uh, many places where we could start. But um, Jen, I want to start with you because you brought up the statistics about 3% uh, or less than 3% of housing stock being suitable for aging in place. And we think that that's an exaggerated number. So when we, when we anticipate solutions or building solutions, where might you recommend organizations spend time at levels? Is it new stock or retrofitting or something in between? Mm. Uh, All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I think of building new stock, and one of the things that I, I probably talk about in this discussion is that I think we need more housing options in general. Um, so we can't just keep building single family homes, especially in the low density places where older adults are living. Um, but the reality is, is that new stock is just a small percentage of our overall housing stock. Right. And we, the, the stuff that we are, have that is not accessible is, the, is what we are mostly are living in. And so, um, we can't ignore that. So retrofits become very important. There are a lot of programs out there that help very low income people with retrofits. They can offer, you know, state programs that offer grants or loans, low interest loans to help you modify a home in order to stay there. Tend to be if you have a documented disability though. And I think one of the things that I think we need to think about is how do we put those, make those um, programs available to people before they have a documented disability so they don't fall, so they right. don't break their hip, um, so that they can stay in that home if that is what they choose to do, if that's their choice for aging in place. Yeah, and even as you answer that question or begin to frame it, on my mind is, and I think the reports and the new report and the original report get us somewhere to growing awareness, but when, when you were speaking, I was reminded we know a lot about what the retrofitting is and how can we come together and help individuals, we'll all face these challenges if we have the benefit of longevity about needing more universal design. So what is this barrier <laughs> around getting us to uh, you know, build new homes or kitchens or spaces that don't meet the needs of a growing aging population? I think to some extent it's, our denial of, you know, our willingness to think about these things, and we often say um, we 
it is best thought of early. So if, if one is in their 50s and they're redoing mm -hmm. their kitchen or their bathroom, think about some of these things. Um, you don't necessarily need to put grab bars in the bathroom, but if your walls are all open and exposed, reinforce the walls so that when it gets to that point, um, it, it's easier to do. That can be difficult. And it has also to do with contractors and architects spreading that word. So all those of you in the room, <laughs> that this is an important thing to, to be thinking about. Um, and so, so I would say it's a lot of that. One thing that's kind of promising, though, is that there's a lot of new technology right. that can maybe take the place of some of these physical interventions. So um, our original report talked about are the um, light switches and the electrical outlets and the thermostat within the reach of a wheelchair? Well, now we have things like palm Nest, you know, in the palm of your hand, and you can control your, your blinds and your, you know, things like that. So I think that there's the potential for some of that. Um, there's even, you know, uh, early, early versions of stair climbing wheelchairs. So how much can that technology um, intervene and, and help us, you know, with these expensive modifications. Some of them are not expensive, but some of them certainly are. Right. So innovation and technology. And I think as I hear you saying, growing awareness that all of these features are inclusive and in some mm -hmm. senses ageless or good That's for right. us across across the lifespan or um, multi-generational families as well. Yeah, I think the goal would be to, ha to you know, as, as people modify, we, we pass that on to the next generation. So our housing stock becomes increasingly um, accessible and yeah. designed for all. Right, right. Lauren, boy, <laughs> let's start with capable. Uh, yes, yes, and you uh, gave such a great presentation, both Jen and Lauren. Um, is capable the future? By that I mean um, capable is an example, as you spoke about it, of healthcare coming literally into the home. So are we seeing a, a, a return to house calls, a resurgence of healthcare? coming into the home, and, and what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's definitely healthcare is involved. You know, my sense is, uh, as much as... Is this one? Sure, sorry. I'm really all mic'd up here with my Britney Spears <laughs> mic and my snow cone mic. Uh, I was saying, um, I do think capable is a sign of the times in terms of how healthcare is going to engage in housing. I don't... You know, I will tell you, out in Portland, Oregon, there are five health systems that came together and invested $10 million in genuinely new housing stock, like broke ground, built 400 units, put a clinic in them. I think that's going to be rare. You know, right now in the healthcare space, people are saying, oh, is this the trend? Are healthcare organizations going to be building and maintaining their own apartment complexes? And I think that's going to be only for the most mission-centric and the biggest... Uh, the biggest health systems in cities. The rest of the health systems and hospitals and doctors groups are not going to be making that level of investment in housing. So they're going to be playing in that kind of pathway to home modifications of different varieties. Mm -hmm. Community Asthma Initiative has been positive. Capable has now been positive in different ends of the kind of age spectrum. So I think it is the future in that way. I think the other way in which it is the future is that if you read the Capable literature, which I just reviewed this morning, it's actually quite co-designed. And I think that's important. So it's a team based approach, again, handyman, occupational therapist, and nurse. Notice there's no doctor involved. And they go in and it's co consultative with the person. And they say, what do you think needs to be modified in this home to make it a place that would be more comfortable and safer for you to live? And I think that idea of placing the agency, or at least maintaining as much agency as you can in the quote unquote patient mm -hmm. is really key because the other way this could go and the other you know other rooms I'm in that are talking about healthcare going into the home is just kind of ramming medical technology over the threshold of the door. Oh, we can just put in a hospital bed. We can just put in a IV drip. Um, and that's another way to think about housing going home. And some people still feel that that's an incremental gain. People would still rather be uncomfortable in their home environment than uncomfortable in the hospital. But I think we're just going to keep learning that um, home is more than a physical space. It's not just about moving hospital equipment into the home. It's really about respecting people's home and saying, this is your space that you have lived in. Tell us how you want it to function. So in that space, sense, I do think it's the future. Yeah, but as long as it's human-centered design yeah. uh, and co-creation, I hear you saying. You both talked about social isolation. And again, I'm turning my head and Rodney looking at you and my colleagues at AARP's Public Policy Institute released a report that showed that for older adults uh, in the Medicare, on Medicare, 
there was an increase annual spend in Medicare of almost $7 billion a year due to isolation among older adults. So Lauren, that speaks to what you're talking about, you know, interventions that are looking at uh, reducing costs. Suddenly but Medicare real. Managed Care is very interested when they but hear that is, number. Exactly. But also the report underscores some of what you're talking about, whether it's housing in low density areas or solo aging mm -hmm. or mobility issues with a house that isn't equipped so you can't access gen community resources. So how does our growing awareness of the importance of social networking and connection play into decisions we should be making about the housing landscape? The community aspect of housing is, is as you're saying, really important. Um, th and, and I know Lauren can speak to this, the, um, the effects on physical and mental health of being lonely. Now, living alone does not equal lonely, but there's that's definitely right. a relationship. And when we look ahead to this very big growing 80 plus population that's going to be living alone, it is most certainly a concern. Um, I think there are great opportunities in the, again, housing option bucket of, you know, we just need more housing options. Thinking about how um, people might stay in the community where they have social ties, but maybe not in that single family home. If that is not right for them, it can't be modified or you'll be isolated and lonely. Can we build more multifamily, maybe it's communal, maybe it's multi-generational, um, with intentional community built in, I think is something that, that we need to think about. And there are a lot of barriers at the local levels to doing this, especially in low density places, but I think it's imperative that we, we do think about it. Um, we can't just build housing out there in rural America, though, and expect that all will be <laughs> solved. That's we right. also have to figure out how to bring services to people, um, and that is, you know, Again, that low density location, transportation is an issue. Um, so I think it's, it's all part and parcel, but I, I do think there's um, a lot of promise in uh, multi-family or multi-unit housing where you can build community and avoid isolation, but stay in your community. Yeah, and just encourage community development at every level, Absolutely. right, for, for all people. Healthcare, let's get back to healthcare, Lauren. If you, what are you seeing so in essence, as you're talking about healthcare organizations, you talked about hospital systems and other organizations really being focused on reducing costs and also promoting more robust uh, well-being and health outcomes. But you cautioned us, don't hand it all over, whether it relates to housing or other social determinants of health. Are you seeing in any communities uh, real shared value work where it might be a healthcare system, they're connecting with CBOs, building pathways to care? that are producing better outcomes for older adults? Yeah, so there's a lot of emphasis on that now, as you might imagine, because of course I'm not the only one issuing these cautions. So um, there have been efforts to build these community collaboratives that have, just as you were saying, healthcare organizations, health insurers, community-based organizations at the table. Um, but I would say we're in the early phases. So there's a ton of work being put into the development of these government structures, right? The Greater Boston Healthy Collaborative. That's not a real thing, but that's what all of these entities seem to sound like. Just replace the city name. Uh, and they're just getting up and running. And their real challenge at this point is, okay, we want to make an, say everyone recognizes the investment of housing. We want to make an investment in housing. They stall at the point of, okay, well, who's going to pay for it? Because you can, as you can imagine, they say, well, particularly if we're talking about some kind of public housing, that's a public good, meaning we all benefit from it. So now how do you apportion the costs of a public good? Should it be the healthcare organizations who pay for it? Because we think they have deeper pockets, they have capacity to make those investments. The community-based organizations are largely saying, we don't have that money, it should be you. But the healthcare organizations look back at the CBOs and say, but you'd benefit from it, so shouldn't you be part and parcel of funding it? So, you know, these groups are coming together, right. they're creating some relationships, they're talking about, I think, the right things, but we've got to come up with some uh, better ways to help them kind of what's called blend and braid funds, meaning take funding pots from a bunch of different organizations or a bunch of different government programs and knit them together to make a joint investment, or some way for them to actually come up with cash and apportion prices in a way that everyone perceives as fair so that they could make these joint yeah. investments. And more, really, you're describing um, through a healthcare lens a more collective impact asset That's right. mapping and management approach to the social determinants. That's right. You know, Jen, I want you to uh, talk a little bit more or maybe highlight again some of the points that you shared in your presentation about housing cost burden mm -hmm. and in 
incredibly impossible choices you identified that older adults are making. You know, do I pay for my rent or my mortgage, which I still have, though we have mythology that individuals don't have mortgages when they're older, or do I pay for my prescription medicine or my food? What else would you want the group to be thinking about those choices? Well, and another one, I mean, those are really immediate. Do I have a roof over my head or do I have my prescription medicine? But what about do I maintain my house? Do I keep the roof, you know, it needs to be repaired? Um, can I get the front steps fixed? Those kind of things have safety implications and, and financial implications because at some point you may have to fix that roof and then, you know, the, um, the amount of people with that kind of um, cash on hand to do it is... And your asset is being devalued if you exactly, can't maintain it. Exactly. So the asset that you're counting on. I mean, we saw the slides about the, the different levels of equity. Um, the, the fact is that most people don't tap that equity in a, in a big way. I, I think most people, um, some of the, the papers out there suggest that people want to hold on to that for their children or they want to save it for that big emergency. Um, although our lives might have more small emergencies <laughs> like the broken steps or, or the things that could make your quality of life better earlier on. Yes. So I, you know, I think that there's just a whole host of trade-offs that people are making um, that impact, um, impact their ability to, to stay in their homes and, and receive shelter. And for people who don't want to leave a particular home, I mean, I have heard stories of people you know, taking a second job in order not to move out of that home. They just don't want to move. So you know, really tricky things that get tied up with the emotion and, and the financial part. Yeah, we just, go ahead, go, Lauren, jump in. Sorry, here's my <laughs> mic again. Um, <laughs> Just following right on what Jen said, there's the challenge of what's the opportunity cost of the money that I invest in my house versus prescription drugs or vice versa, meaning what am I not paying for when I'm making this payment with scarce resources. But then don't forget there's also the stress of living with the with having to make that decision and having to make that decision routinely, which from a health perspective, we know is not good for you. And if you have to make that over a long period of time and we think inequality is worsening over the life, life um, cycle, then you know it's not just what do you not pay for, but it's that enduring, nagging feeling that I don't know what I should pay for, I don't know how to prioritize this because I don't know when the leaky roof is gonna become a hole in my roof. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up, Laura, because actually, studies in our work with low-income older adults would show that um, vulnerable older adults, they know how to budget. They know down to the penny. <laughs> they know what their expenses are, what their needs are. Uh, the issue is they don't have enough income. So it really is about economic opportunity. Um, you ready? Let's turn to the audience. See if uh, those gathered, if you have questions for either Jen or Lauren or just something in general that you would like both to speak to. We, we We'd be have, happy to take some questions. We have some mic runners. If you just want to raise your hand, they'll bring you yeah. a mic. Hi there. Um, I think one of the other things that we've experienced, I'm in the um, fire safety business, uh, specifically wildfire. Uh, what people decide not to pay for is insurance. And mm -hmm. there's thousands of people now that are never going to be able to go back to Paradise, California. So I don't know if that's another impact in terms of the fire safety aspects or uh, public safety aspects. And so, you know, you, I'm glad you brought that up, and it speaks to often the ongoing displacement of the most vulnerable members of our communities. Yeah. You want to add anything to that, Chair? No. Okay. Lots of hands. Yep. Some, some up, here. up here. Here comes the mic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for presenting. That was great. Um, I'm curious. Excuse me. Um, how you see the role of systemic racism playing out in social determinants of health, and if that is not properly acknowledged by our policymakers, how those policies that are still affecting people in this present day affect not only our current generations but as as we age as well. Well, I would. I'll jump in, and then Lauren and Jen can jump in. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up, because there is appropriately a lot of conversation about coming together to identify and address social determinants of health. But if we don't continue the truth-telling about centuries of inequity and indifference and discrimination and address that first, um, all of our work will not mean more equity. I don't know, Lauren, if you want to jump in on that. Yeah, no, it's... Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
It's a great question. I'm glad you named it. I mean, it, the systemic inequities we know, particularly in the healthcare space, run from the kinds of care you receive in a clinical setting all the way through to kind of the segregation of communities that I was referencing before. I think one of the big things that healthcare and kind of the social determinants of health uh, movement in general is struggling with now is one of the ways um, that I think you kind of start to maybe mitigate what we have right now as a largely uh, racist infrastructure is to give decision-making power back to particularly communities of color and say, you tell us what you want to do to improve the social determinants of health or to improve the health status of your community. But I will say the reason, one of the reasons in which this is very difficult, particularly for clinical folks, is there's just so much enthusiasm right now for evidence-based medicine. And to give up the power of being able to allocate where that money goes to a community that might say to you, let's just like think in the hypothetical, you know what would be really nice for us? Um, we'd really like more vending machines, because when I get in from my second shift and it's late at night, I just want something quick to eat before I go upstairs. The clinical community is going to say, oh, well, that's not evidence-based, that's not going to improve your health. And then you're at this really interesting and difficult juncture where it's like, which of these principles is going to win out? The evidence-based practice, the evidence-based policy making, or the idea that we need to transfer decision-making power to people who have not historically had the agency to make choices about their own lives. And, you know, it's just, all I can say is I continue to push for, sometimes you've got to do the unevidence-based thing to start building a relationship over time, and then maybe down the road they may make different choices, but I'm not even sure you can count on that. I think really going straight at systemic racism means transferring the decision-making power and saying, whatever you choose, you choose. But it's very uncomfortable for health policy, clinical communities, even the social determinants of health people who like to ta talk a really good game about health equity, myself being one of them, it's just like a tough thing to do where the rubber hits the road. Yeah, I think in the housing world, I mean, um, I talked a little bit about the inequities in home ownership, um, mm -hmm. and those obviously, um, for many people in the room, know a long and deep history of racial zoning and racial covenants and redlining um, that have resulted in generations later these very disparate home ownership rates. Uh, but not only that, as I said, you know, um, minorities are more likely to have mortgages and more likely to rent as well if you know the home ownership rates being lower. Um, and those put you in vulnerable situations where your housing prices, your housing costs, if you're a renter, are apt to go up over time as your income is going down. Um, so there are, you know, obviously really significant things, and that's one of the reasons why we brought you all together today because um, your acts, you know, a lot, so much of your, the social determinants of health and so much of your um, life is determined by where you live. And if you don't have access to those communities, um, then you're shut out of a lot of opportunities. So I think, I'm hoping that this afternoon we talk about how do we bring age friendliness and livability right. um, into all of our communities and, and to all of these conversations. Sure. All zip codes. All zip codes. Right. Question in the middle. I guess as apparently the only person over 80 in the room, I ought to throw out a few practical comments. What, what older people need is really very simple. The main thing I've found, uh, I'm the moderator of the Agassiz Council, which is the neighborhood just north of Harvard, is um, a second set of handrails to prevent falling. It's not expensive to put in, any handyman can do it. And if there's a place where, like going down to the cellar, uh, there isn't room for a railing in a distant corner, you put a grab bar, uh, simple to do, and you just need to publicize it. Now, on the issue of displacement, Cambridge is the world's classic case of that because we have people moving into Kendall Square, uh, young people getting $400,000 salaries because of their biomedical skills, renting our one-bedroom apartments, and that is a recipe for displacement. I've thought about this a lot, and I think the answer is a zoning suggestion, which is if you're going to build, say, a new office building that's going to employ a hundred high-paid, and this applies to Harvard and MIT for education, because there's high-earning people there. The zoning requirement should be that you have to build housing for a hundred people. 
and half your employees aren't going to want to live in that building, say. That leaves 50 places adding to the supply of housing in that category, which is a simple economic way. It puts a burden on the people who have caused the problem. And Harvard and MIT don't think they've caused the problem. And the people doing life-saving work in Kendall Square don't think they've caused the problem, but they have. And my final suggestion for encouraging home ownership, uh, I'm the past president of the local and state realtors, and the big problem that people face is not that they can't afford the mortgage, they don't have the down payment. And the rate for second mortgages, if you can find one, and they're hard to find, is 18, 20% or higher. Our city borrows at 2% because we have, you know, tax exempt bonds. We could easily provide second mortgages for half the down payment for home ownership and say charge the same rate as the first mortgage, 4%. We'd make money on it, and we would encourage more home, home ownership, which, as your statistics show, are key to the thing. I hope these practical suggestions are helpful. Yeah, I want Jen to jump in a little bit, but you do raise this, probably another entire convening about being sure that we have financing vehicles that are credible and trustworthy, as opposed to those that are fraudulent for vulnerable, low-income people. But Jen, will you talk a little bit about community accountability to adding options to housing stock? That's yeah, what we're yeah, hearing. And I, right, and I, I'm, I thank you for the comment and the, and the suggestions because I think um, I, I mentioned how constrained we are at the federal level, and we can definitely talk about how we might be less constrained at the federal level. But the fact is that um, our cities and our towns have a big role in this. There's a lot that they can do, um, e even if it's not directly financing the housing. Um, and regulation is a big one. And typically, that can mean positive regulations like inclusionary zoning, which Cambridge does very well. Um, it can mean removing other barriers. And I think in a lot of our suburban communities and our rural communities, um, thinking about how do we remove some of those barriers to multifamily housing um, so that we can build some of this, this what I was talking about, the, the more communal aspects. Um, and, and thinking too about, um, you know, do we want these communities to be places for everyone and for all ages? I mean, that's, that's sort of the core of what I hope we get at today. And, and we all think about, um, how do we make places inclusive um, and inclusive of age too? Because I, I think a lot of suburban communities see themselves as places where people go to raise kids and then there's the back to the cities movement and a lot of older adults are moving back to Back Bay and it's all, it's all good, but it's, it's not happening that way. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of stories in the Boston region and other very high cost markets where people want to move out of their single family house, but they can't afford to downsize in their own town. And so they leave that town. And so I think it's, it is really imperative to think about how do we create multi-generational communities. Um, it, I, for one, want to live in a place where there are people of all ages, not just um, people in my slice of, slice of life. Yeah, you're right. Call the question and answer it around inclusion. And including age inclusion first, yeah. and then design around that. We have to wrap up, we're between you and your break, but one more sort of lightning round question. If you could change one thing about the current housing landscape, what would it be, or housing and healthcare, in your case, Lauren? Jen? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> more housing options. We've got to get out of this mindset that it's all about single family, and um, if people want to stay in those communities, then we have to provide options for them to do so. Great. Loosen the restrictions on how healthcare can spend money on housing to let them actually contribute to some larger investments in creating new supply as opposed to only these kind of housing search, housing navigations, case management type answers. Great. Join me in a warm uh, thank you to Jen and to Lauren.